My name is Saeed Malami and I am the student director of the Mill series here at Lafayette. I was told to keep this introduction brief and I'll try my best. The purpose of the Mill series here at Lafayette is twofold. First, to introduce students to a range of viewpoints wider than that which is commonly represented on campus. And second, to encourage and create respectful and constructive conversation that would lead to the intellectual development of students. In line with our second mission, to create respectful conversation. Please keep all phone and device use to the bare minimum. The event today is being recorded and we will be published online for non-commercial, non-advertising purposes. Also, a mic will be passed around during the Q&A for you to speak into for the recording, not for amplification. You may very likely disagree with one or a number of points raised by our guests tonight. What we ask is that you do so with respect and a need to understand. Your presence in this room is a signature to the covenant of mutual respect between you and our speakers. As the president of Mill Series, Brandon Van Dyck once said, <laughs> if there was an individual most influential in the creation of the Mill Series, it would be Jonathan Haidt. Jonathan Haidt is a professor of ethical leadership at New York University's Stern School of Business, who studies moral psychology and emotions. His recent work greatly identified a problem on college campuses that, well, no spoiler, he will expantiate upon. But the Mill series was created in, res in response to the, the identification of that problem. Jeffrey Sachs is a professor of politics at Acadia University who has been arguably Haidt's most ardent and honest critic, and an incredible writer on college free speech issues in his own light. So in some sense, he critiques the foundations upon which the Mill series was founded in response to. The question remains, if he's able to convince us otherwise, perhaps there may be no mill series after this. <laughs> this evening, they will shed light on where they agree, where they disagree, and all the good stuff that lives as always somewhere in the middle. Please join me in welcoming Jonathan Haidt and Jeffrey Sachs. Okay, but I think I, think I go first. Um, so, well, this is just wonderful. This is, uh, I've been concerned about a, a problem on campus that turns out to be a problem in our broader society with rising polarization. It becomes harder to express opposing views. And uh, uh, Brand, I guess Brandon emailed me a, a couple years ago about starting this, the, the, this Mill series. Um, and so this is exactly what I think is most needed, a, a forum like this. Um, that brings people together in, in this way. And, and I must say, I can't think of a better pair of speakers for this, for this than me and Jeff, because I think what you'll see is that we really do model exactly what John Stuart Mill said were the advantages of bringing together opposing views. And I think as you'll see, Jeff and I have learned a lot from each other. Um, and one really cool thing is that we end up like uh, witnessing for each other, defending each other on Twitter when right. you know, people are you know, attacking either one of us for, for something. So I'll just briefly tell like my intellectual background, which sort of brings us to this point, I think it'll illustrate a couple of the broader points that are relevant to our discussion. So I'm a social psychologist. I study uh, morality and how it varies across cultures. I did my dissertation looking at uh, morality in Brazil and the US. I worked in India. And in the 90s, I began to notice that left and right in this country were becoming like different countries, uh, different cultures. There's a US constitution on one side, and there's a very different US constitution on the other. Different history textbooks, different economics textbooks, now different climate science textbooks. Um, and so I began getting alarmed. And this is not, not so much in the 90s, this is a little in the 90s, but especially in the 21st century. Things really changed after around 2000. Um, and the, the lines of, of cross-partisan hatred have gone up and up and up. Now, it's terrible for democracy, but it turns out it's terrible for universities. It's terrible if you want to find truth. Because the more you hate the other side, the less you can think freely, the less you can change your mind, the more you're locked into your team's conclusions. So I began getting concerned about this. I, st I, I began writing my book, The Righteous Mind, actually not so much to solve that problem, it was because I was on the left and I couldn't stand that George W. Bush won twice. And I, and I thought I could do better for the Democrats if they only knew, like I, I could write their speeches, I could advise them on morality. And so I set out <laughs> to write a book um, like, which would basically say like Democrats, you have no idea how to talk about morality in the United States. You know, you just live in New York and San Francisco, you have no idea what American morality is. Um, and so I set out to write this book that would explain it all. And in the process I committed I committed to understanding conservatives from the inside. 
I'd spent some time in anthropology with Richard Schwader, a brilliant anthropologist. And so I decided, you know what, I'm going to immerse myself in conservative writing. And I subscribed to the National Review. I watched Fox News. I did all that stuff. And an amazing thing happened, which is, even though at first it was unpleasant, and I would find myself like yelling at them, after you get over it, you know, it's like you jump into a cold pool, like it's unpleasant at first, but then, you know, hey, the water's actually pretty good. I realized, wow, I, I never thought about that. Oh, you, you know, th this is, you know, a, a counter view of this, of this kind of regulation or of this, tr oh, I never, that, wow, I never thought of that. And it's so obvious when you say it in the abstract that to understand anything complicated, you have to look at it from more than one perspective. It's obvious, you all know that, but yet we don't do it. We don't do it when taking other perspectives is treason. And so as a social scientist, I actually found it really thrilling. Um, and, and by the time I finished writing The Righteous Mind, it wasn't about how the left can win. It was about how we can all understand each other because we're all trapped in this game. We're all tribal creatures who, who you can bring out the tribalism and play it up and then we get nasty and vicious and illiberal, or you can calm it down and we can learn from each other. And so by the time I finished The Righteous Mind, I was more of like a kumbaya, we, can't we all get along, we need each other to learn, and especially in universities. So that's sort of the backstory. So then I'm going along and I'm working on a book. I, I moved to the NYU Stern School of Business and I'm supposed to be writing a book on capitalism and morality. And my friend Greg Lukianoff comes to me and says, John, weird stuff is beginning to happen. This is 2014. And Greg, I think, is the first to diagnose this, this pattern of cognitive distortions that we saw at a few schools. Um, and I'd, I'd begun to see it at NYU. And so I, I wrote this paper with Greg called The Coddling of the American Mind. That comes out in August of 2015. Um, and then we sort of go back to our, our work. And then Halloween 2015 comes along. And then everything blows up at Yale and, and at other places. Um, on another, like all these strands came together. I also was concerned about the loss of viewpoint diversity in the academy. And so I co-created with other professors Heterodox Academy. And that was unrelated to the other projects originally. But once everything began to blow up, I began to see the culture of college campuses changing. And so I, at Heterodox Academy and elsewhere, we, we began writing about it. And we began talking about these changes. And we were certainly embraced by the right. The right loved what we were saying. And the left was in denial. And, um, um, and so that sort of was like the dynamics of it. And then I, people began to see me as right wing. If I'm criticizing the left, I must be on the right. Because if you're not with us, you're against us. That's the way the tribal mind works. Um, so we're going along. We're writing all this stuff. And you know, we're celebrated on the right. And, and there's a lot of skepticism on the left. Um, and then um, you know, things seem to get worse and worse in 2015, 2016. Um, and then this guy writes a Twitter thread saying, uh, what was the title? Um, was it there is no free speech camp crisis? Or it's a myth or something it's like a myth. that. Yeah, the right. free college free is a myth. And, you know, at first I think like, oh, you know, this is just, you know, how can you, like, this is just so obviously wrong. Um, but you actually look at his, at his, you know, he, it was a Twitter thread with like 15 tweets or something in it. Too long. Uh, refer, no, no, no. <laughs> Um, and, he, and he's citing data, uh, his analyses done of GSS data by Justin Murphy, but he really, Jeff really expands on it, and then he turns it into a, into a Washington Post article, I think it was, and he makes the case, and okay, so now what are we gonna do? Um, now, you know, we'll, we do what academics are supposed to do. We look at his data, we see whether, where is he right, where is he wrong, we refine our argument, and we actually get closer to the truth. And so, um, and so that, those initial exchanges, I can't remember if they were on Twitter or what, but they were just like perfectly civil, like exactly what academics are supposed to do. And right away, I learned a couple of things from Jeff that have changed the way that I talk about, uh, that, I, that I give talks on this everywhere. And thanks to Jeff, I now make sure to say early on in whatever, whenever I'm speaking, I make sure to say early on, you know, there are about 4,700 institutions of higher education in the United States. And at most of them, none of this stuff is happening. The shout downs, the what, none of, it's mostly what we're talking. So right away, what Jeff made me do by calling my attention to the facts is refine my argument. And that was a big improvement in what I was saying. And another thing that he helped me to do is to really be explicit that, you know what? 
It is a moral panic on the right. And a moral panic is a sociological term for this feedback loop in which something happens, news media play it up, amplify it, sometimes say false things, sometimes just exaggerate, and then it, you know, and, and it's to serve a political end. There is a moral panic. There certainly was a moral panic about with right-wing media picking things up. Um, usually it wasn't complete fraud. It usually wasn't fraud. It was like usually like exaggeration, partial storytelling. But when you dig into things, as you as you were doing, as others were doing with the, the um, Oberlin thing, there's usually more to the story. There's almost always more to the story. And so now I say explicitly, yeah, there is a moral panic. And so if you just if you read right wing media, you will not understand the truth. Now the left says it's only a moral panic, and there's nothing happening, and that's wrong too. So I think on this we both agree that the right is exaggerating it, the left is downplaying it. There is really something happening. And then the question is, okay, now let's really get to work at figuring out what it is. And so I'll just sort of close this by saying, we have all kinds of amazing quotes from, from John Stuart Mill. Um, uh, my favorite philosopher used to be David Hume when I wrote The Righteous Mind because he talked about the power of intuition driving reasoning. Uh, but now, for our era, it's John Stuart Mill because he is the philosopher who explained that we're actually pretty dumb on our own. We, um, we get lazy when we're not challenged and we need critique. We need people to say why we're wrong or just to, even people who give us bad reasons why we're wrong make us get up from our slumbers, as Mill said, and do the work of becoming more right. And in this day and age, I think this is absolutely vital for any well-educated person. This is the mission of a university. A university that doesn't expose people to challenge is a, mission, is a university that could turn out students who are less intelligent when they leave than when they arrived. And that's not Lafayette, that's not you. Okay, over to you, Jeff. Well, uh, there's really not a lot I have to say. I think this, I wasted my time putting this together because <laughs> John said pretty much everything I wanted to say uh, just to get us started off. Um, I guess all that's left for me to really do is just express my appreciation to John and uh, to uh, thank you for, for having, having me out here. It takes a lot to pull me out of hibernation in Canada this time of year. Um, I am sick as a dog, as you can probably already gather. If I collapse in a fit of coughing halfway through, I'm counting on you to, to jump in and rescue me. Um, but when I heard that John was involved with this, it was an easy call, the decision to come. Um, I first got to know John, as he says, on this, this, this Twitter conversation we had, and then we met in person. Uh, just about a year and a half ago or so in Manhattan at the Comedy Cellar. Um, and of course, I've been reading and learning from John much longer than that. And he really is just as nice and genuine and insightful a person in real life um, as he comes across on television or in his books or, well, or online, uh, which is a rare commodity, I think, increasingly, especially online. Um, so it was very an easy decision for me to come here. Um, but it was also an easy decision because uh, the Mill series, I think, really does represent one of the ways that we can get ourselves out of this mess that we made. Um, John's right. There is this moral panic, this climate of alarm uh, bordering into hysteria in some cases about higher education, about atmospheres of self-censorship, of political correctness, of snowflake students run amok. Uh, that really does the conversation no good. And one of the reasons why I wanted to come is to uh, have this conversation with you guys and maybe assuage any concerns that people might have about this, this climate of hysteria. Um, at the same time, I wanted to come because John's right. There, there have been changes. There is something different, and there are problems. And so what we need to do is have a kind of a calm discussion based on evidence about what those problems are and, and what real solutions look like. That conversation doesn't happen very often. Um, I don't see much of it, not enough of it, happening uh, in state legislatures or uh, in, among politicians in federal government. Um, we don't see that conversation happening. We don't see it happening in our newspapers of record or in partisan media outlets where the thumb is always on the side of the scale that generates the most clicks mm -hmm. and the most yeah. hysteria. Uh, so if it's going to happen, it's going to happen in places like this. That's why I wanted to come. And, and I think that we really can have that good conversation. Um, in all the work that John has done, both on his own or in collaboration with people like Greg Lukianoff, who is the president of the Foundation for Individual <coughs> Rights and Education, uh, or with uh, Gene Twenge, who is a social psychologist, uh, or with everybody else that he's, he works with over at Heterodox Academy, um, I think that's where we're going to see these solutions arise. 
Um, I'm not a member of FIRE, I'm not a member of Heterox Academy, but I do see the good that they do, uh, which is why I'm so thrilled to be here and, and, and to talk with you guys and, and also with John. So I think mm -hmm. with that, we can probably okay. throw things in and okay. get started. Well, let's, well let, yeah, let's, let's uh, talk about a couple things where we thought that we might dis disagree and try to hone sure. in on what we think is happening. Also, uh, Brenda, can you bring that, that bag over? I want to un unwrap the, um, I brought a couple copies of the Mill book. I want to just pass those around for people to look at. <clears throat> um, just one other piece of, of my story is um, because I found it so helpful to actually listen to, to see what conservatives say on social policy issues, um, I ended up um, convening and chairing a group of America's top poverty experts from the left and the right. And we worked together for a year to come up with a, um, an approach to, to, to ending intergenerational poverty. Everybody, everybody agrees that, there's, that the kids are blameless, that's, that we need to do what we can to break the cycle of poverty. And so I ended up, um, okay, oh, thanks. So I ended up um, running this uh, bipartisan group and we worked for a year. We came up with this amazing report, the best thing written on poverty in the 21st century, I think, because we actually had input from both sides and because we knew everybody that Hillary was going to appoint to all of the relevant cabinet positions. We were all ready to go when she took <laughs> office. Um, so the report is now 90% off at, uh, you know, on Amazon or whatever. But, um, uh, but, <clears throat> but. What really led me to see, there was a handout. Oh, I don't know if we have, do you have, have that handout? Hand go around? Yeah, There's the, okay. so I just want to read, I just want to read this one amazing quote from, from Mill that really has been, I think, my guiding star as a social scientist. Um, yeah, so it's, the, it's that first quote. Um, let's see, I'll just start in the middle there. It might, be, it might be plausibly maintained that in almost every one of the leading controversies, past or present in social philosophy, both sides were in the right in what they affirmed, though wrong in what they denied. And if either could have been made to take the other's views in addition to its own, little more would have been needed to make its doctrine correct. So in talking about poverty, the left is always talking about structural and economic factors and systemic racism. And you know what? They're right. They're right. And the, I'm sorry, the left. Yeah, the left is always talking about those. Yeah, the left is always talking about those things. Whereas the right is always talking about the decline of the family and personal responsibility and, and you know, the instability in the family and men passing through and, uh, and they're right. So um, each side is, is sounding the alarm about things that we really should be listening to. They just aren't listening to the concerns that the other side expresses. So to really solve anything, you actually need, you need a, um, multiple views, you need, you need the critique. Um, so, okay, that's my, uh, now to focus on what we think is, or what we thought we might prof profitably debate or discuss before we throw it open to your questions. So that most of our time will be to discuss with you. But let's see, we said uh, the substantive question, what is happening on campus? What are the trends? What do we agree on? Where do we need more data? Right. So I'll start off by saying um, Jeff's critique helped me stop saying like Gen Z is turning against you know, free speech. It's, it's not like the average that's changed. There are small changes in the average. Um, what's changed is the dynamic. It's my claim is there's a change in the dynamic, not at all schools, but at most, at, certainly at elite schools in the United States, and you see a lot at, the, at many schools in Canada, the UK, it's happening a little bit in Australia, New Zealand. Um, and the dynamic is where previously someone could say something, someone could tell a joke, let's say, and someone would say, well, that's tasteless, that was the end of it. But now with social media, it, becomes a, it blows up, it becomes a giant thing, it can make it into the newspapers. Um, so there's the, there's the possibility of explosions. Um, there's a call out culture. So it's not just if you say something that someone takes to be racist or sexist, if you even make an argument, if you even question something. So if there was to be a debate about transgender, uh, you know, should transgender people be allowed to compete uh, in the in, you know, male or female sports, that's a reasonable thing to talk about. But now, if you say no, if you say trans, uh, trans um, women should not be should not be competing in female sports leagues, if you say that, you will be called transphobic so fast and shamed and humiliated, therefore people won't say it. And when you get people self-censoring, when you get, you know, it's like, let's have a discussion, and I have a gun on you, let's have a discussion. If you say something, I don't know, I'm shooting you. Okay, you know, like, it just doesn't work. You can't get the million process, the process of coming to truth. So my claim is that the dynamics changed pretty sharply right around 2015, from 2014 when Greg began to notice it, through 2016 after Yale and all that stuff. 
that the dynamics change. People are much more on edge. Um, at the elite schools, it's not in all the departments. It's not as much in the, so again, this is thanks to Jeff. Like, it's not everywhere. It's not, and even at universities, they're big, complicated places. So at least in the humanities and social sciences, this is a big problem. In the sciences, it's not, not much of a big deal. But that's my claim is that there's a real change in dynamics, and it's a change that prevents us from achieving our telos. Telos is that Greek word that Aristotle used. Like, what's the purpose of a university? What's the purpose of anything? And the telos of a university, I believe, is truth. The research aspect is finding more truth. And then the educational aspect is passing it on to students along with the skills that will allow them to find more truth themselves, crit habits of critical thinking. If that's our telos, then this call out culture, the shaming, the fear, the social media blow ups, this prevents us from achieving our telos. And that, I think, is an existential problem for universities in the United States. Well, I mean, I, I don't agree, I don't disagree with at all with the idea that the purpose, the telos of the university, uh, is the search for truth. The, uh, the acquisition and dissemination of truth is the basis of what we're all here, the collective enterprise of higher education. Um, and I think to the extent that the sorts of phenomena that John uh, has identified, this kind of self-censorship, this call-out culture to the extent that it exists, um, that, is a, that can be most definitely a problem or an obstacle to that telos. Um, but let's just all take a moment and think about where we are right now and what we're doing. He and I are having a conversation dedicated to finding out the truth of these hot button issues of campus free speech. Now think about how incredibly structured and artificial this moment mm. is, okay? Yeah. You're all silent. We are up here talking, right? Um, as Saeed himself uh, you know, said when, in his remarks, you have all implicitly signed a contract by attending here today <clears throat> that you'll be respectful and that you will hear us out. There'll be a question and answer session at the end, a mic will be passed around, one mm -hmm. question at a time. God willing, there'll actually be questions and not long diatribes. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> this is an artificial environment that we're all in, and I think usefully so, right? Yeah. Yes. Sometimes conversations must be artificially structured in order to really take off and, and, and gain some altitude. I think then that we need to think about ways of balancing our telos, which is a search for truth, with the way that we get there. The questions then, where things get muddy very quickly, is figuring out a way that we can have our productive conversations, the way that we can figure out what the truth of the matter is, in a way that ensures everybody in the conversation feels respected and dignified and mm -hmm. uh, accepted as someone whose voice can actually contribute to the debate. The problem, or maybe that's not the problem, but the tension then that exists is that these things do sometimes butt heads. Not always. At their best, and I think the Mill series illustrates that, uh, they, they go hand in hand. But a lot of the, 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 the frisson, the, the tension that we see in these, in these debates has to do with sometimes what makes people feel dignified, what makes them feel respected, what makes them feel a valued member of a conversation is in tension with the kind of million free-for-all, that's a, a bastardization of mill, but this kind of million mm -hmm. uh, free-for-all where everyone just says what they want to say and truth will out. So I think maybe that's one of the ways that we can frame uh, the problem that we're in right now. How do we make sure that our conversations are civil and structured and dignified mm -hmm. while at the same time uh, always directed towards that mm -hmm. North Star of the yeah. truth? Unfortunately, I completely agree with what you just said, so we have to <laughs> dig deeper. No, I think, so, so th and this, this is, like, we're moving on to advanced, to advanced topics, which is, so I think what, what okay, so at Heterox Academy, Sean Stevens and I wrote three long blog posts sort of responding to Jeff and the other critics, and, and the view that we came to um, is that it's not that Gen Z is souring on free speech, in the abstract. Rather, Gen Z is so much more focused, especially on issues of race, but all kinds of issues of identity. And so it's exactly the issues Jeff said. How do you create a climate in which historically marginalized members of historically marginalized communities feel that they're, voice, that they're heard? So, so what Jeff just said is, is the challenge. I think we agree that this is where a lot of things come to a head. We're talking about something which is a little controversial, but it's not, we're not talking about the red hot sacred 
blow up topics. Right. Those topics are race, gender, LGBTQ, immigration, and one or two others. I mean, that's where most of the explosions happen. Um, and so before we get to that, that, that absolutely essential question of what kind of speech climate do we want? And it is, I agree with you, it's not a John Stuart Mill free for all, everybody can say anything, whatever they want. That, that would not help us advance to our telos. Um, so, um, so my question is, where, where do you think we disagree now? And you can think about that for 30 seconds while I say, <laughs> while I say so um, Mill's work is so important um, that at Heterox Academy, when, I, when we were thinking, well, if there's not much viewpoint diversity among the faculty on campus, where are students going to actually find these different <coughs> viewpoints? And so we conceived the idea of just like taking classics and putting them up online and making a viewpoint diversity reading list. And so John Stuart Mill, the second chapter of On Liberty is the most amazing treatise ever written on the nature of speech, inquiry, dissent, and learning. But it's, it's 14,000 words long with a bunch of historical references that are obscure. And so um, I happened to meet up with uh, uh, um, uh, Richard Reeves, actually was one of the scholars in that poverty group. He's a biographer of Mill. So he and I reduced the text by 50% and um, uh, and wrote an introduction. And then this amazing artist, Dave Cicerelli, came and said, hey, I love what you're doing at Heterox Academy. Can I help? And I said, yes, illustrate Mill's metaphors. So here it is. So um, the, the, this is an art book, which is expensive to produce. So you can buy it for $20 on Amazon. Uh, but you can get the Kindle for $3, and you can get the PDF for free. Just go to heteroxacademy.org slash mill, and you can get it for free. Our hope is that it will be assigned reading or at least uh, optional reading at every university in the country. So I'm just going to just pass it, just so you can see how beautiful the illustrations are. Just you know, take a look at, pass it around, and then pass this up to about the fourth row there, or th uh, fourth row, and then have another version passing around. So I urge you to check it out yourself. How many people here are faculty? Raise your hand if you're a professor or faculty here in any way, shape, or form. OK, so I would urge you, I hope that you'll take a look at it, especially if you have any sort of freshman classes. I think it would be ideal for that. OK, after this commercial announcement, back to you, Jeff. <laughs> sure. Well, I mean, while we're on the topic of Mill, um, on this sheet, you know, uh, John and I were, were having a chat about what we wanted to talk about today. And uh, he came up with the idea of having some quotes from Mill on here. Uh, two of them are his. One of them is, is mine, and or maybe two of them are mine. Meaning I chose one, you chose two, but they're all Mill. They're all Mill. Yeah. Anyway, um, I, as, as soon as he, he's, he mentioned Mill, I knew exactly the quote that I wanted to put up there. Uh, so it, it's the second quote in particular. Um, it reads, uh, and for those of you that are, are watching uh, online, I acknowledge that the tendency of all opinions to become sectarian is not cured by the freest discussion but is often heightened and exacerbated thereby. The truth, which ought to have been, but was not seen being rejected all the more violently because proclaimed by persons regarded as opponents. So this is usually the part in my class when I do this, when I ask a student to put this back to me in plain language. Uh, I will spare you that kind of torture and I'll just tell you flat out what Mill is saying here, what he's acknowledging, I think very, in a very sophisticated way, is that the freest atmosphere where everybody can say what they want to say does not reduce polarization, mm -hmm. what he calls sectarianism. Okay? If the concern that, that John has, and I think quite rightly, is polarization in America, this kind of fraying of the, the bonds that knit communities together, whether they, whether they be as small as Easton or as big as America, the freest conversation might not actually be a solution because mm -hmm. polarization can actually grow worse in such climates. I'm sure that social psychology probably has a lot more to say about this today than Mill does. I'm gonna, I don't want to advance that claim too strongly. Mm -hmm. But I think Mill is onto something when he points to this tension. And when you think about the world today, <coughs> when you think about American politics today, I think it's hard to deny that there are voices that we're hearing today that are frightening. There are opinions that are being advanced that are concerning. And it's not necessarily apparent that a free wheeling conversation on the internet where everyone just says whatever they want is the way that we get to a less polarized America. I'm, I'm not, obviously, to be clear, I am not saying that we should censor the internet. That's not at all I'm trying to talk about. I'm just saying in general we should think about ways in which the freest conversation possible <clears throat> is not <clears throat> how we get to the truth and is not how we necessarily get to less polarization. Mm -hmm. This yeah. might be a place where we disagree, though, I think. I bet it isn't, because I'll, I'm going to say something which I'm sure you're going to agree with. Wasting your time, guys. Yeah. We all agree. Uh, um, <laughs> OK. So what I, I'm often asked the question, like, well, where do you draw the line between free speech and hate speech and things like that? 
And, um, and what I found is really helpful is to not answer the question directly because it's, the, the, you know, it, it's a malformed question. Rather to say, you can't have this discussion in the abstract. You have to focus on institution by institution. Look at an institution, look at a context. What is its telos? What is its purpose? Once you're clear on that, now you can choose the speech norms that will be conducive to that purpose. And so let's start with the public square. In the public square, if you're out uh, in, you know, if there's some green or something here in Easton and somebody wants to say the Holocaust never happened, should that person be arrested? What do you think? No, we live in a country, there are some countries in which they could, and that's a decision they've made. But in the United States, we've made the decision uh, that you cannot be arrested for saying things, unless they're threats or, you know, there, there, are, there are exceptions. But the First Amendment is about what the government can do to you to restrict your speech. Now, what's the telos of the public square? Is it truth? I don't know what it is, but it certainly ain't truth. Um, let's move to university now. In the university, if we agree that our telos is truth, if we agree that truth is hard to find, if we agree, and my God, what we've learned in the last five years is that truth is a lot harder to find than we thought even five or 10 years ago. We have a replication crisis in psychology and other fields so that even our experiments are not as reliable as we thought. We've got a much more manipulated internet with foreign agents trying to manipulate us. The, so in many ways, truth is literally harder to find now than it was five or 10 years ago, I believe. Um, so given all of that, what should we be doing on campus to achieve our telos? And I think it certainly <coughs> isn't free speech. Everyone can say anything whenever they want. That's what'll, you know, because as Jeff said, and as Mill said, that often makes things even worse in terms of polarization. What we clearly need are norms. Okay, be, let's be a social psychologist first. Anything that gives us a sense of shared purpose and a long future brings out much better, more civil behavior. So if you meet people anonymously with no future and you're anonymous, you know, that's the internet. And that's why comments like comments on YouTube videos are awful. In fact, we ended comments at Heterodox Academy. We should be having comments in debate, but comments among anonymous people are so horrible, they don't serve any purpose. They certainly don't, they, they let individuals display. They don't serve, they don't advance our telos. But conversations among people who are part of a community that are bound together for four years or longer, not anonymous, with a sense of noble purpose, with a sense of learning, with a sense of shared uh, role models, well, that's beautiful. That's college. So we've already developed these norms. And what do we call, you know, we think of our, our industry as the academy. What does that mean? I believe it's a Greek word for olive trees. I believe, just from looking up on Wikipedia, Plato's academy was just, it just referred to the fact that there was a place just outside Athens that these guys would get together for these special kinds of discussion. And as Jeff said, what we're doing is a little bit weird. And what they were doing in the academy was a little bit weird. It wasn't the kinds of discussions you normally have in the town square. They were moved outside the city to a bucolic, beautiful place where they could have private discussions. And so that's what we need. We need speech norms and social settings that are conducive to bring out our ability to actually do give and take, to learn from each other. That's what we need to focus on, not free speech, but norms that are conducive to finding truth. I assume you totally agree with me. Uh, well, maybe, maybe this is where I'll disagree, disagree a bit, but then I think we should, maybe we can move on because I think this might not be able to be resolved fully. I would just say, I mean, there's a reason why Plato conducted his conversations outside the walls of the polis. It's because his teacher was forced to kill himself after being convicted of impiety and corruption uh -huh. of the youth. Um, universities are not islands that exist outside of the polis, outside of, of democratic discourse. Um, they're in the thick of it. I think that in the Deweyan sense, you know, it, it must be that universities, in addition to serving their function as identifying truth, serve this democratic function as well. Um, and I think Wait, we, what's, what's the democratic function? The democratic function uh, is something like how we can think about producing good citizens, okay. ethical citizens of, of the republic. Um, Plato disagrees. Plato's first move, you know, in, in his Republic, for those of you that have read the Republic, um, one of his first moves is to kill all the, all the poets. Yeah. Uh, so uh, there's a pretty heavy censorship um, uh, in, in, in Plato's ideal world. Um, in the university that I think we, that, that we need to have is one that recognizes the fact that it's located firmly within the Republic, within the democracy. 
Um, what that means is that universities are far, far more complex than I think just people gathered together in a bucolic setting. Um, there are people whose, whose jobs are to work at universities. And I don't mean just faculty, I mean administrators, I mean staffers, I mean custodials, custodian staff, I mean uh, chefs. Uh, the number of people who are involved in making a university as an institution function is enormous and enormously diverse. Taking that complexity seriously means maybe in some ways there are multiple telli. I'm assuming telli is the plural of telos. I don't know Greek. Um, but there might be multiple telli that overlap. Um, and thinking about how those pieces fit together is, I think, a difficult task. I think it's much more difficult uh, than the university might look if we think of it just in terms of faculty and students. When we think about the university in a much more complex, segmented, kind of federated space, we see these complexities popping up and they don't necessarily all fit together beautifully. Um, so I think maybe part of the reason, part of the places where we disagree, potentially, uh, is, is thinking about what the university's function is and what it, what it takes to keep this old rickety machine mm -hmm. based on a medieval monastic model humming yeah. smoothly. Yeah. So I, I would only disagree that, that it has multiple teloi or teloses. I did look it up. Either, <laughs> either one is acceptable. Telos is a, is a permissible plural. Um, so you're certainly right that if you look at all the people in this little, in this almost city, in this po polis, you could say, in the athletic department, the goal is not truth. Right. In the fundraising department, the goal is not truth. So it's, it's what uh, Clark Kerr of the University of California called a multiversity. We live in this giant multiversity now. But it would be a mistake to say, well, just because most people aren't pursuing truth, therefore, we've got all these different tel teloses. No, the university is here. It has a special grant of respect and tax exempt status and, 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 and the things that we say are given extra credibility because our telos is truth. Now, um, if the athletics department, as often happens, is doing things that undercut our ability to find truth, like we're pressured to give the football players better grades because we, they're needed, that's a classic example that it hits business all the time. You have to be pragmatic, make trade-offs. If truth is truly our sacred value, then we don't make trade-offs. And so I would argue that, yes, many people have multiple goals, but if we, if, we don't, if we don't see truth as our sacred value and as our one overriding tell us that there are no compromises with it, we would never say, oh, well, you know, look, for $10 million, can't we just lie a little bit? Like, no, we can't. So, um, so I would say everything makes sense if you keep that in mind. Now, the problems that we're having in universities quickly are spreading out into the corporate world, and it's interesting to see. In journalism, um, it's hit hard in media. And journalism is fascinating because journalism is much like the academy. There's an, they have a real set of professional ethics, more compromised by financial pressures than us, but there are, you know, there are real professionals there. And as young journalists are coming in, as Gen Z and younger millennial journalists are coming in, they don't have the telos of get the story, find the truth. They don't have that telos. Their telos is fight fascism, fight racism. And that means you don't give a platform to views that you find hateful. And older journalists, now most journalists are on the left, so this is a battle between older people on the left and younger people on the left. I've talked with a lot of journalists. This is raging in the New York Times and the Atlantic, and sometimes those debates come, get leaked out. Um, so this, this question of what's the telos, if you lose sight of that, then the culture war will overwhelm everything. And that's, my greatest, that's one of my many fears about our country, is that social media and rising polarization are leading us to knock down the walls of professionalism in different domains of life, so that everything is the same culture war everywhere. And it's coming to restaurants near you. Soon, if, you know, as it's already, you know, we've seen it in Washington. You know, if you see someone from the Trump administration, it's okay to yell and scream at them in public, because everything is the culture war. That's where I think we're headed if we lose sight of our teloses within each institution. Okay. Well, I mean, uh, I, I, I would want to know a lot more before I buy on entirely. I, I'd want to see some survey data, for instance, about the opinions of journalists and um, what journalists coming into these media outlets are saying and what they believe. So I'm, I'm curious to know whether this is based on qualitative kind of interviews or chats mm -hmm. with people or whether it's 
based on something a bit more representative of mm -hmm. the industry as a whole. So, uh, and you may have that, I don't know, but I, I think yeah. I'd want to know Sorry. a little bit more about I'm, this. I'm smiling, laughing, because this is exactly a repeat in microcosm of exactly the debate <laughs> we had over free speech in university. So yeah. you're right, you're right. I'm giving you anecdotes. I'm giving you only anecdotes. There is no survey evidence that I know of on this. Um, and anecdotes are, are valid. Anecdotes. This could be, they're this could a great be way, completely They're true. a great way to start. They're yeah. a great way to start. But yeah, yeah we do need to get uh, some data And I think that maybe this is you know, something that we do need to take more seriously and think more about is, is are, is the incoming, I guess, you know, crop of journalists, do they have different goals? Do they see their function in media as more about mm -hmm. social justice and less about, you know, uh, about identifying the truth? Although, of course, you know, journalism has always had maybe an informal maxim of, uh, what is it, uh, comforting the weak and uh, afflicting the powerful. Afflicting the powerful. So, yeah. uh, you know, the, it, there's always been perhaps a bit of a social justice bent to, to journalism, and, and, and so maybe I'm not quite sure. Well, it's always going to lean left, and therefore it has a special obligation to remember its fiduciary duty to the truth. And I would say the same about the academy. We're, we're always going to lean to the left. That's not a problem. But we have to have a fiduciary duty to the truth and not think we can sacrifice the truth because it's important to defeat Trump. Well, this might be actually a, a good way to... to, to transition to a different kind of question, which is the liberal dominance in the faculty and in university spaces mm -hmm. in general. Uh, because the universities, just like journalism, do lean dramatically to the left. I am myself ludicrous, ludicrously far to the left, right? Um, so close that I'm about to fall off this non-stage that we're on. Um, <laughs> but I would be blind to deny that universities overall across America lean to the left, especially liberal arts colleges, especially in New England. I think that if you were to yeah. do a census of a uh, survey of, of, of faculty here at Lafayette, you would find uh, unquestionably a very strong liberal and democratic uh, predominance uh, in, in the faculty. That's not uh, a good thing or a bad thing. It's a complex thing, and we can talk about some of the well, places where it might be bad. It's a bad thing if it exceeds certain numbers. Hmm. So if it was two to one, three to one, no problem. You don't need balance. Right. You don't need equality. What you need is the certainty of dissent. And once it gets to 10 to 1, 15 to 1, that one person, either often there's zero, so it depends on the department. A study done by Mitch Langbert of liberal arts colleges, top 50 or 60 of them, found that in anthropology, um, it was about 200 to 1, left to right. And in the great majority of departments, there were zero Republicans. Um, economics is the most right-leaning department. It's only 4 to 1, left to right. So economics can function because there's a 4 to 1 ratio, left to right. That means in an economic seminar, somebody is not on the left. Though I'll note that that, that data is based on, uh, on donations, like on campaign donations. Yeah. There's a lot of uh, gray area about how people donate, um, where, how races are competitive. Um, in New England, uh, where the, he's looking for in, the, in this data, um, there aren't a lot of viable Republican candidates in many of these races. Wait a so. second. In New England, that's where you find actually some of the most you know, interesting Republican, like, you know, like, you know um, Republican governors of blue states actually tend to be pretty moderate and have a lot of national appeal. But I'm sorry, we shouldn't get off of the yeah. tangent. The, yeah, the, the, um, uh, but, but you're right. Well, unquestionably, you're correct. That there is, I, I think this, this point about maybe 12 to 1, 15 yeah. to 1, it's real. I mean, yeah. these numbers, it's, there's too many, too many studies mm -hmm. confirming this yeah. incredible domination of, of the left in, in faculty. So I don't, yeah. I don't deny that okay. at all. All right. So should we, should we open up to questions or anything else you think we should talk about before we... Well, and we can talk more about this issue in the, in the, in the, in the, answer, the question and answer session. And also, um, in particular, about you know, self-censorship um, and some of the special challenges that maybe conservative uh, students face, which I think are very real yeah. and need to be taken seriously. Um, maybe that's the better address to yeah. the question and answer. Okay, good. So let's... Oh, I mean, whatever you want, but I think it's okay if you want to take five or ten more. I don't want to speak for everyone, but I just did. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Because we have... Yeah, because we have... Our plan is to... Break, let's say a little before six o'clock. Well, we have to go to dinner at six. Yeah. So maybe we'll break it like, we'll break at 10 to six. Jeff and I will hang out here and talk to people right. for a few minutes and then we'll, we'll head out at six or so. That's the plan? Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, let's see. So uh, let me, okay. So here's a couple things I can tell you that I've learned from, from right from being in this for so long. Um, in social psychology in particular, we are experts at racism, prejudice, the study of, racism, prejudice, discrimination, hostile climate. And um, I, got, I really got 
active in this area in 2011 when I was invited to give a talk at the leading at the main conference of social psychology. The president of the of the organization asked me to give a talk on a panel where we're talking about the future of social psychology, and. And I was beginning to notice this problem that we couldn't have honest discussions about political topics, that people were self-censoring. Faculty now we're talking about. Um, and um, um, so, oh wait, where was I going with this? Okay, so I gave this talk about how this is a problem for the quality of our science and a wonderful thing happened, which is nobody, well, a couple of people got angry at me, but overall, my colleagues actually accepted my arguments, they pushed back on some, we had a civil debate, people kind of agreed this is a problem. But over, then over the next few years, I started getting a lot of emails from grad students, from young professors saying they have to hide, they, they, they have to hide their beliefs, that they're just sick and tired of people making so many jokes about how stupid and evil Republicans are, uh, conservatives are. Um, all that we know about hostile climate for race and gender is happening for politics in the academy. Um, uh, so we, uh, there's a lot we need to do to, to recognize both on moral grounds, we should not be pushing students away, we should not be shaming students, we should not be blocking their careers. So on moral grounds, but just as much on straight quality of science epistemological grounds, we need them. Um, if you are a conservative or libertarian or even a centrist, you might sometimes feel discouraged about pursuing a PhD or entering the academy. But what I can tell you is we need you desperately. And what I can also tell you is you will have vast fields of inquiry wide open to just you. <laughs> um, it's amazing the way people on the left will cluster into just a few hot topics, leaving the rest of social psychology or political, I mean, I don't know if it's true, it's true in political science, but at least in social psychology, yeah. yeah. So if you're bold, if you can conduct yourself in a civil way, um, there are, it, you actually can have a great career ahead of you. Um, so I would, urge, I would urge you to consider, to consider that. Um, that's oh, I, I agree entirely. And I think especially to students here, um, I don't know, those of you that, that might be conservative or might be unsure where you fall on the map, um, there, there are a lot of, I think, fears or concerns that conservative students or right word leading students have about presenting themselves on campus, defending their ideas. Um, will my professor penalize me? Will I be punished by my friends and, 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 and coworkers and students? Um, this is, I mean, this is the real tragedy of this climate that we're in right now because conservatives, like every other member of the, of the community here on campus, should feel free to express mm -hmm. themselves and to explore their ideas and to state their positions. I think part of what I want to do is, I think, just to reassure those students that a lot of the hyperbole about what happens mm -hmm. when you come out of the closet as conservative or when your professor finds out that you uh, are pro-life, a lot of those fears are, are, are baseless. Mm -hmm. part, of my, part of what I do, unfortunately, is I follow a lot of really toxic Twitter accounts mm -hmm. and I subscribe to a lot of awful email <coughs> listservs about, uh, from organizations that fundraise off of this climate mm -hmm. of fear. I'm not gonna name them, who really cares? Um, but uh, they're out there. And uh, one of the things, for instance, that they say is that conservative students get punished by their professors mm -hmm. because, and they receive lower grades, right? Who here, out of curiosity, has ever heard this argument that conservatives, if they state their opinions, will receive a worse grade? Mm -hmm. Okay, now just a general show of hands. Who here, out of everybody, believes that the grade they received for any assignment was not based on the merit of the assignment, but because the professor didn't like them or uh, is a cantankerous old person or something outside of the project itself? Show of hands. A few of you, few. okay. okay. And, and of those who are raising their hand, how many of them, how many of you think that it was for politics? It was because the professor disagreed with you on politics. Raise your hand high. A few, okay. Okay, so that's less, so it's mo most of them were not raising it for politics. That's originally. great, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I mean, the point I want to make, and maybe I didn't illustrate it very well because you guys are oh, such a well-adjusted bunch, um, <laughs> <laughs> is that um, the, I mean, we have studied this. We've, the research is coming in. I'm not saying it never happens, for instance. Yeah. I would be lying. Uh, p professors are, have their biases like everybody else. But overwhelmingly, this is a groundless fear. We've done the surveys every which way we know how, and I think John's read the same data I have. This fear, for instance, that professors will penalize you, it, it's not really based on, on the evidence. Um, I'm happy to talk more about, like, about this and other issues, but I think part of what I want to do 
is turn down the temperature a little bit with some of these fears that we have because conservatives should feel ready and comfortable stating their positions and vigorously defending them, whether in the classroom <coughs> or anywhere else in, on campus. And I think that, that, that requires taking a breath and seeing where the truth actually lies and what, where the hype is. Um, okay, I think, uh, yeah, let's, let's, let's take yeah. questions. And Absolutely. We'll um, so just to start off, um, please do not speak unless you have the mic so we can get it in the recording, first of all, if you have a question. But I'll just um, kick off the Q&A with a question for both of you um, individually. Um, Professor Hay, um a common critique of the popular critics of the campus left is that they, are all, they all suffered some backlash from that group, from the campus left, that pushed them towards becoming more critical. Mm -hmm. Have you suffered any such backlash? And if yes, as someone who studies morality and moral motivation, mm -hmm. how do you think that that has affected your motivation and understanding of the campus free speech crisis? Yeah. So I'm sorry. So the claim is that if you look at all the people who are active in, in critiquing this, most of them are actually on the left but they're people on the left who were, uh, who moved, <coughs> yeah. yeah. So there's, yeah. um. Well, let me just, yeah. so just to, right, okay. so we just get just it. Try, yeah. his, his question, um, while campus protests from the campus left have markedly reduced since um, post-2017, it seems as though there's an equal rise of protests and no, pla no platforming arising from the campus right, a great deal of which you have highlighted on your Twitter page, like Georgia's, like Georgia Southern University's book burnings. One could attribute these to Haidt's thesis of fragility finally manifesting on the right. Um, what do you think that these um, protests, especially on the right, have arisen from, and why this time? Okay. So I'll take that one first. There's a, <coughs> uh, there's a line from Hemingway uh, I read uh, back in college. I think it's, it's from whichever one where he's in World War I and he's fighting. Uh, the sun also rises. I, I th okay. Or that's a, yes. Some, no, excuse me, uh, <coughs> farewell to arms, yes. Farewell to, farewell to arms, yes. Some, I think this is a quote. He, he said, you know, at one point, if I remember correctly, yeah, he's, uh, the Italians or so, whoever their allies are, they, they're shooting at him or for some reason they attack him and he says something like, and suddenly the whole damn war mattered, uh, mattered to me about as much as somebody else's college football game. Um, there's something about having your allies turn on you um, that is really embittering. Now, um, it's, okay, that actually wasn't exactly relevant here because it's not as though people then said, I'm out of here, I don't care. But there's something about being turned on by what you thought was your team or your side is really embittering. And you see this a lot. So there's a kind of a standard script. So it was very clear in the Christakis's, it was clear in a lot of the cases, because most of the people, the great majority of faculty are on the left. So somebody gets in trouble is probably going to be on the left. And what they do is they proclaim their progressive bona fides. They say, but, 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 but I did this and I'm on this and I've always been this. And, you know, like, but, oh, no, I'm, I'm on your side, I'm on your side. Um, and then that never does any good. Um, the dynamics of the, the, the mob dynamics here that we're beginning to explore, um, a lot of sociologists are getting interested in, the sort of the mob dynamics are such that it's not about reason, it's, it's a ritual. Um, witches are punished to solidify the community. Um, and so the, um, when, when you get people turning on you, and when it's in, incredibly scary, first of all, um, you have to, uh, I often call up the professors when this is happening and much of the time they're, you know, they're taking sleeping pills or taking tranquilizers to sleep because um, it's, it's qualitatively different to have your reputation damaged or destroyed in public than anything else. And you know, so I've never felt that I'm like overwhelmed by arguments that I can't handle. I've never felt that. But the few times when people on Twitter are calling me terrible names, you can't address it. You can't reach those followers. It hurts like nothing else. Um, and it really, it can be embittering. And so this is a very common experience. And there was just a survey done by Michael Shermer of people who are associated with the intellectual dark web. As I sometimes am, but you know, like people like Steve Pinker and me, like there's nothing at all dark about us. You know, we are tenured <laughs> faculty that, but we, but uh, what, and what Shermer found is that it's mostly people on the left um, who are kind of bitter about the illiberalism of a part of the left. Now, Jeff says he's far left on policies that may be true, but I like to distinguish between the liberal left and the illiberal left. And Jeff and Nicholas Christ, uh, um, uh, uh, um, Nick Kristoff are two of my favorite liberals. They are wonderful exemplars of the liberal tradition. That so, is an insult that I can't let stand, I'm sorry. <laughs> what? That oh, you can be as far left as you want, but you're liberal left. All right. You, oh, oh, you want to be illiberal left? <laughs> Well, I'm not yeah. sure if I would, I would, I would frame it like, quite that way, but no, yeah, go ahead, okay. please. Yeah, no, basically, so, <laughs> yeah. 
So my point in answer to the question, yes, this is something that I've seen. And at Heterodox Academy, at, you know, at first, you know, there aren't that many conservatives, but a lot of them came and joined because we were one of the few places that was, you know, nonpartisan and pushing back against this. But, you know, as, this, as things went on, we get a lot of people on the left who have had some run-in like this, who are doing their job, they're teaching, they're doing research, and suddenly they're called all kinds of horrible names or there's a, you know, a Twitter mob or a campus mob against them. It's really embittering. Right. No, I mean, I, 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 I do agree with that. And I, I'm, thank you, I consider myself a, a, a liberal in, in the broad million, Tocquevillian yeah. tradition. Uh, absolutely. I, um, I think, maybe, well, I'll respond to, to Said's question. Um, so uh, Said correctly notes that in 2016 and 2017, during the height of this deplatforming wave, <coughs> as well as this more general uh, kind of campus free speech crisis, I'm putting that in quotation marks, um, in America, uh, we were seeing uh, about 40 or so uh, deplatformings or de attempted deplatformings uh, each year on American campuses. Um, of those, about half are successful. A deplatforming, for those of you that might not know, just refers to an attempt by somebody within or around the campus community um, to prevent an invited speaker from speaking. Um, so if one of you were to stand up right now and try to shut, shut us down, that would be a deplatforming attempt, an unsuccessful one because I would not cede the stage. Um, so there were about 40 odd or so in 2016 and 2017. In 2018, that number fell off a cliff. Yeah. There were 18 uh, yeah. that year. Now, again, I just want to note, these are all very, very small numbers. Uh, as John you know, brought up in the very beginning, there are about anywhere from 4,700 to 5,200 four-year degree granting <clears throat> universities and colleges in America. So we're talking about, you know, uh, 0.000001% of these cases. Um, and I can talk about new data in Canada that kind of also illustrates how rare these things are. Um, however, we, this year, we are seeing a spike again. And the spike, I'm sorry to say, is driven by deplatforming attempts coming from the right. Uh, FIRE right now breaks it down on their- Is it campus. on campus or off campus right? Uh, well, it's a mix. FIRE, okay. uh, uh, no, th well, this is a very salient point, actually, that John's making. Um, there's a cliche that threats to speech that arise on campus tend to be from the left. Sp uh, attempts that arise off campus tend to be from the right. And this cliche is true. Um, most of the attempts to deplatform people uh, in, uh, coming from the right this past year have been initiated, for instance, by state Republican parties yeah. or by uh, lawsuits brought by special interest groups uh, conservative interest groups to block certain kinds of speakers, often because they're perceived as being anti-Israeli or anti-Semitic speakers. Um, and now also, for those of you that are just reading the headlines you know, very recently, there's this bizarre new trend, I don't want to call it a trend, I, I'm terrified to think of it as a trend, in which there's a far, far right faction of uh, white supremacists that are sabotaging speeches by conservatives like um, uh, Donald Trump Jr., for instance, from the right because they're trying to inject white supremacy into conservatism. Uh, Wait, what is their, what is their strategy? Like, why are they doing, like... Oh, my like God. What? This is a, Just when you think not get the nuttier. rabbit hole you want to go down. But okay. um, essentially what it is, uh, really quick, because I don't want to take up too much time, is um, there is a, a group of, of white supremacists uh, that are called groipers. Groipers? Okay. What have I done with my life? Um, yeah. <laughs> called Groipers. You know, if, if those of you that know who Richard Spencer is, uh, white supremacist, he, yeah. this is in that circle of, of, like of racism. True Nazis, true neo-Nazis. True neo-Nazis, uh, alt-writers. Um, they shouted down just a few days ago Donald Trump Jr. and his partner Kimberly Guilfoyle uh, because they were trying to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, they were trying to ask questions, leading questions, white supremacist style questions as a way of kind of putting the foot of white supremacy into the door of, <coughs> of the Trump administration in this book tour. The same thing is happening to Charlie Kirk. He is the founder of uh, Turning Point USA, um, another organization, uh, a conservative organization dedicated, well, dedicated, I have negative yeah. thoughts about Me, them. But I do too. regardless, what, yeah. they're, you know, what they are ostensibly about is uh, creating space for conservatives on campus. But now we have this neo-Nazi faction from their right 
trying to force their way in. Yeah. And they're deplatforming people like Kirk and, uh, and Representative Crenshaw, Texas uh, uh, representative, as well. Um, what I'm trying to get at here is that there is a rise on the right of these same sorts of tactics that we saw in 2016 and 2017 on the, on the left of deplatforming. Um, I don't think it's because conservatives have given up on free speech just the way I don't think liberals gave up on free speech. Mm -hmm. I, as a political scientist, I see deplatforming as a social movement tactic. Yeah. Social movements are always innovating. They're always adopting new tactics. This deplatforming tactic um, is one that people are adopting. They're making it their own. They're putting it to use. Uh, we're seeing it deployed now. We're seeing counter tactics deployed in response. And um, I don't think it heralds a dark new, new chapter in conservatism. Um, I don't think it's going to make any kind of headway. But I do think that it is something we'll have to look for because these numbers of, de of deplatforming attempts are going up. And it's unfortunately being driven right now by conservatives. Yeah. I'll just add t t one point very briefly. In the, there's a very interesting and influential article on victimhood culture by Manning, uh, uh, Manning and Campbell, two sociologists. And it came out in 2014, like before I'd even heard of all this stuff. Like they, they were seeing the first hints of it in 2013. And they say that victimhood culture has elements of the culture of honor, which is you know, even a tiny little th offense can't be left to stand. Um, but, you, uh, but you don't settle it yourself. You appeal to authority to settle it for you in victimhood culture. And they say it comes about in only in the places that are very egalitarian and where there's an authority that you can appeal to to come in on your side. That's their basic analysis. It's a very interesting article. And they say it especially, it, it, it comes from the left on college campuses, but they say back in 2014, but this tactic will eventually be taken up by the right, that conservatives will, will likely start using this as well. Um, at, at, and for that very reason, that you, get, that you get these social movements and one innovation here seems to work, and so then it'll be copied here. And in the middle of a r rapidly escalating culture war, yes, that's what's happening. And so the um, you know neo Nazis on the neo Nazis on the right are are real, but boy, do, I don't think there's very many of them. But wow, are they an excellent boogeyman for the left to say, see, this justifies almost anything we want to do. And then Antifa on the left, I don't know how big it is, but there are videos of them. And then this justifies the people on the right saying, oh my God, those people are violent. The violence is coming from the left. So it's like you know we're in the middle of this escalating culture war, it's kind of like we're living in an increasingly dry forest and the internet allows us to throw matches all the time. So please, don't do it. Just don't retweet things um, that are like, hey everyone, get more angry about this. Only retweet things that shed light on things. The first audience member to ask a question spoke into a mic that had not been turned on. His question in a nutshell was, what is the role of activism in the STEM fields versus in the humanities? So I'll, I'll take it first. So my view is that the telos of the institution is truth. The telos of the classroom is learning. So there is no role whatsoever for activism within any class. That's my view. You can be an activist, do that on your own time. Um, but activism corrupts the search for truth. So um, as far as I can see, um, most scholars in the humanities are true scholars. They are trying to find out what happened. They're trying to give uh, honest analyses. But there are certain fields, and this would get us into the, into the studies hoaxes and all that stuff. There are certain fields that were formed for a, um, a social justice purpose. And my sense from hearing from students in those fields and from looking at you know, some of the publications are that their goal isn't, the, for their telos is not truth, their telos is social change. And that's an important discussion to have. Should we have departments in which the activity of the people in the department is social change rather than truth? I think the answer is no. Um, I think that for my entire career up until 2014, there were those activist departments, but their activism stayed within their departments. And so there was a kind of a, you know, most of the university was devoted to scholarship, but we had certain departments that were really about activism primarily. But after 2014 or 2015, the walls came down, and now that activism is spreading. Um, for example, I just had, I had lunch a couple weeks ago with some professors at a major Midwestern university, one of the top psychology departments. Uh, they're cognitive psychologists, and they said, we don't teach intelligence anymore. It's just not worth it. Now, your education suffers. If you can't learn the basic facts about intelligence, intelligence testing, IQ, if you can't learn that because the professors are afraid to teach it because they're activist students, what, how does, who does that help? It helps Charlie Kirk and the people who want to say that the universities are losing their minds. So I think there's no role for activism in the classroom. Um, um, it's something you should pursue on your own time. 
I mean, I'll just say fast. I actually, I, I'm a big supporter of those departments. Um, I believe passionately in, in the value that, uh, for instance, women and gender studies programs or um, Africana studies programs add to the university and to its telos to find truth. Um, and I think, you know, there are excesses. There are bad articles out there. There are articles published that have no basis in any kind of evidentiary, uh, any kind of fact that, that I can readily identify. Um, but uh, I, I think that overall, these have greatly enriched universities um, and, and, and helped forward their mission for, to, to identify truth. But um, again, I think maybe this is also where we have to think on a case-by-case -case basis yeah. and sort of figure out, in, yeah. sorting out the apples, figuring out the good ones. That's right. the in bad. theory, I think you're right, but in practice, I, I don't. So how do you establish these norms that you're talking about in universities to have discussions when universities are not a place where people go to seek truth, they're places where you <coughs> seek skills that you get jobs like that's the main goal that i'm noticing every day mm -hmm. so like i feel like that is hindering like there are no discussions that like that are commonly happening in universities so like mm -hmm. just how do you establish that when the purpose of the universities has completely changed so so this i think is a failure of leadership um so uh, when i started at yale in 1981 and uh, you know, I'll never forget the sort of the freshman, the orientation. It was held in this in Woolsey Hall. They had this gigantic pipe organ, and and we were, you know, it, it was really conveyed to us that we are the heirs of a long tradition stretching back to Socrates. And then the pipe organ played, and my chest was shaking, and it was like it really was like an initiation into a cult. And the cult, <laughs> but the cult, but the cult was the worship of truth. Now, you're right that things have changed a lot since then. There's much more of an emphasis on practical skills. Um, there's been an enormous decline in respect for the humanities. And when I was at Yale, the humanities were held in extremely high esteem. That was the most prestigious parts of the university. Um, I would say it's a failure of leadership in a lot of ways. Um, when you are welcomed onto this campus, I hope the president, were you addressed by the president? And do you, anyone remember what the president said? What, what did the president say? The president essentially talked about how Lafayette is trying to have um, like conversations where like everyone's viewpoints are heard, essentially. Mm -hmm. So okay. And did the president talk a lot about how we're going to, we're here to Im improve your future employability, we're here to raise your salary? No. Okay. So that's, so if you have that feeling, I think something's gone wrong. Um, I think the university needs to make clear what its purpose is. And, in, and incidentally, we hope that you will be more employable. But if, you, if your goal is just to get a job, maybe you should go to a technical school rather than a liberal arts college. Um, I would just say, and, um, and for practical solutions, the Mill Series is exactly one of those solutions, and other organizations like it. Bridge USA is a new organization yeah, they're great. that uh, is doing something kind of similar on campuses yeah. across America. Um, for conservative students who might be are, uh, timid or feel uncomfortable speaking, I would say the best thing you can do is to find other conservatives, form groups, organize, and, and uh, bring people to campus to speak. Um, bring sober, serious voices. Don't go for that provocative voice yeah, that is right. going to get you terrible press that will you know, really make a lot of ruckus, yeah. but ultimately is actually going to damage yourself on campus. And then lastly, to any faculty that are in the audience, and I say this now, as a Canadian, the number one thing that you can do to ensure faculty academic freedom is unionize, okay? I live in a country where 90% of faculty are unionized. This is a country where 20% of faculty are unionized. Before I came, I read the faculty handbook of this, of this college. The academic freedom protections are lousy, okay? Mm. I'm just gonna say it, they're not very good. And I think if, you, if faculty want to have academic freedom, the surest bet, and it's the most controversial thing I'm going to say here, because admins hate it, is unionize. In all due respect, do you know the name of the street that you walked up to Dell Street? Who is that named after? Please Can tell I me. The question? Because the foundation of the tenure process in American higher education is from a faculty member here at Lafayette. I mean, I'm, I, I think tenure is incredible. Tenure is essential. So to critique the, the faculty handbook, I think, would be remiss of the larger context of this institution. Is it fair to say but that not everybody has tenure or is on the tenure track who instructs students here? Absolutely. Yeah, and, and historical facts may not shape what actually happens on, on the ground anymore. Hello, um, I'm William McAlpine. Um, I'm an anthropology and gov law double major and sophomore. I was wondering, because you guys really emphasize the truth versus social activism I and did, like the yes. practicality of it. Yeah. 
and I was just wondering, <laughs> that's fair, yeah. Um, I was just wondering, when we talk about finding the truth, that we've, it's not always in a bubble, that it still is, we still live in a social society where the truth does create action and things that happen. So when we try to have these discussions about the truth, how do we separate it from activism in a way where we can find the truth, but also acknowledge how it's still actively impractical and our biases that come with it? Hmm. Um, I'll take a first stab at it. Cause it's, sure. um, so uh, first, absolutely, we, have, we all have biases that affect how we process things. We all have motivated cognition. Um, I'm going to say something which might be a little controversial here, which is um, I think that almost all of you should pretty much not do any activism until you really have studied something really, really well and know a lot about it. And that means probably not until you're older than you are now. The reason I say that is this. I've only, I only know of one case of excellent activism, and it's the Parkland students. What they did was they really studied the history of the debate. They really read up on it. They came up with a platform, uh, I think it was a nine point plan. I used to run a gun control group at Yale. I know a lot about the issue. I read their program and said, wow, this actually, this is really thoughtful. And then they went to Tallahassee and they pushed to have it passed and they failed. But that's to me is exactly right. Um, in contrast, the, one of the main lessons I've learned from conservatives is that social systems are incredibly complicated. We almost never understand them fully. Um, they have a certain structure and to, that we don't understand. And to the extent that we knock them down, we know not what we do. What many activists do, and this is true since the French Revolution, is they say, let's just knock it all down. Um, and without understanding it, you tend to get uh, much worse counter effects. Uh, you tend to make things worse. So since society is complicated, social institutions are complicated, anything about race, gender, politics, immigration, inequality, these are all incredibly complicated issues. And to have a bunch of 18, 19, 20-year-olds taking something that some, that some simple-minded cure and saying, we demand this, and we're not going to make reasons for it. We're not going to give you evidence and arguments, Mr. President of the University. We're just going to take over your office. We're just going to threaten a social media uh, uh, a firestorm. until We're going to intimidate you until you do what we want. And what we want, by the way, is actually going to make things worse. Um, but that's what's happened on college campuses. One example that I feel very strongly about, in every, every bathroom at NYU, there's a sign telling students how to report me if I say something they don't like. It's called a bias response team. It's one of the things that the students demanded and the president gave in, or the committee that recommended it. Um, so this is the kind of reform we get over and over again. It's an activist-driven reform. It backfires. It doesn't help anything. Um, I don't tell jokes. I don't show videos. I'm a boring teacher. It really changes my teaching. Professors are afraid to teach intelligence um, because of it. So I would say, generally speaking, whatever activism you're doing, don't do any of it until you've really studied the thing well, and then go ahead. I would say, I mean, Activism is a muscle and it atrophies with age. So I would caution against waiting too long uh, to, to put it into work. Um, and I think John's absolutely correct that you should not engage in activism until you've studied an issue and thought carefully about it. And, and listen to dissenting and, views. And listen to dissenting views and stakeholders involved. <clears throat> but I don't think being young is any kind of barrier. And I can tell you, activism is not easier when you're in your 30s and you're married and you have a mm. job and you have a lot to lose. Okay, in a lot of ways, you guys are the ones who can afford. I can't speak for everyone in this room, but maybe you can afford to be active uh, in a way that that I can't. Um, and maybe to point to a very wonderful example of positive university-driven activism, I went to school in Chicago, at University of Chicago, and uh, after I, I, I left, um, the, the students realized that there was a massive problem in the south side of Chicago in the midst of this epidemic of gun crime, and that is that there was no trauma center at the university hospital. Um, and as a result, people were dying because the ambulances couldn't bring them in on time mm -hmm. to a trauma center. Um, the university resisted building any kind of trauma center because it wasn't affordable, it wasn't, didn't make financial sense. The students, however, in conjunction with non-student stakeholders in the community, worked together, brought enormous pressure to bear on the university, and the university created that trauma center. This is probably back in around 2009. Um, this is a great example of, I think, the kind of positive activism that students can do. However, John is right. In this case, they read up on the issue. They informed themselves. They listened to dissenting views and, and before they actually you know, put foot to turf to wave a flag. 
So good, I think good, that's, yeah. that's the, the balance that needs to be struck. It's a nice example. Hello, so my name is Siddharth Vijay. I'm a chemical engineer and math econ major here. And with regards to the liberal dominance within faculties on liberal arts campuses, such as this one as well, right? I think what I'm interested to get both of your perspectives on is when it comes to the truth that is being pursued in each of these different departments, are those truths the same? Is it a singular truth? And if not, if, if there are differences in these truths, or at the very least, different perspectives from which the anthropol anthropolo anthropology department will come at it, as opposed to the economics department, then this ratio, this ratio 14 to 1 as opposed to 4 to 1 as opposed to 200 to 1, to what extent is that indicative of the fact that maybe the truth in that field does lie closer to the left? And as a result, faculty might be aligning themselves with the truth that they have found and thus be aligning themselves here. Not necessarily saying that I agree with that, but I'm interested to see what you guys think. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I could take it from, uh, so let's take I a think philosophical. Do, so. Yeah. yeah, so uh, I had a long debate with Sam Harris about this. Sam Harris who argued in the moral landscape that the truths of morality are like the truths of chemistry, and I, I strongly disagree. Um, uh, many people seem to think either it's a fact or else it's opinion, and that's all there is. <laughs> Um, but that's not correct. Here are three different kinds of truths. There are non-anthropocentric truths. These are truths that don't, it doesn't matter what our sensory apparatus is. Earth was the third planet from the sun and gold is a better conductor of electricity than aluminum. And this was true before we were here and in other solar systems. I mean, if aliens came here, they'd discover these. Non-anthropocentric truths. <coughs> it doesn't matter whether you're on the left or the right. It, it doesn't make much difference when finding those. And so those are generally what STEM fields are about is these non-anthropocentric truths. Then there are anthropocentric truths, which are true only because of the kind of evolutionary software we happen to have. And so um, some painters are more talented than others. Some writers are more talented than others. When Jeff and I grade papers, we're not, it's not just our opinion. There are standards of evidence and, and argumentation. Um, and so there are a variety of things that are true, um, but they're not like the truths of chemistry. Um, so that's a second cl class, which you could call anthropocentric, anthropocentric truths. Then there's a third class, which is a kind of anthropocentric truth, which are truths of the market. So it is true that gold is more valuable than silver. That's a fact, that's not my opinion, um, but it wouldn't necessarily be true in another, in another galaxy. Um, and so I personally think that moral truths are emergent truths like that. Um, uh, as, uh, the, our moral truths are relative to the kind of society that we live in now. That doesn't mean they're subjective in my opinion, they are emergent truths. So once you look at it that way, I think the answer would be, um, I am not a relativist, um, there are truths. Um, however, what really differentiates the academic departments is the nature of the methods that they have chosen or come to as the best and most reliable means to find their kind of truth. And I think Sam Harris was wrong to say the methods used in chemistry should be used in philosophy. I just don't think that's right. Oh yeah, I mean, I, I certainly agree. I think it's the methods that differentiate uh, the disciplines. Um, I think that when I think about what I want my students to learn in a class, I teach, I mean, I, my specialization is in Middle Eastern history and politics. So it's a, a thousand miles away from what we're talking about today. When I teach my students, I want them to walk away with a better understanding of uh, Middle Eastern colonialism, of Islamic history, of the nature of the Quran, that sort of stuff. But that is useless knowledge for 99% of my students. What I also want them to learn is how to learn. I want them to figure out how to research, how to understand an issue, so that when they're out there in the world, they can use the tools I give them and make them work for them when they're in a business meeting or whether they're uh, you know, on, the, on a factory floor or wherever it is they wind up. I want them to use those skills. So I think uh, we can think about the role of these departments um, differentiating in many different ways. One of them is different notions of how the truth can be arrived at, and also the kinds of skills that we are trying to cultivate in our students. And when I think about what I want to do, yes, a lot of it is master this subject matter, but also it's what do I need you to know how to do so that you can do it on your own. Right. Good. Thank you, first off. This has been a fantastic talk. Um, my question is, on social media like Twitter and Facebook, discussions seem to be almost entirely anecdotal. So do you think the lack of data being used in these spaces is contributing to the problem? Well, you're on Twitter about nine hours a day, it seems. So I'll let, I'll let you answer that. Uh, yes. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we, we'd all be better off if there was more data 
less anecdote. And John's right. You can hit retweet on it something uh, on the latest outrage, and it blows up, and it's not necessarily representative of, of, uh, of what's going on out there. So, I mean, again, I follow a lot of accounts like Campus Reform <clears throat> and the College Fix. Um, these are organizations that highlight um, the pathologies of higher ed and incidents of liberals run amok. Um, and these... Uh, these stories do gangbusters online. People eat them up and they work their way onto Fox News um, where they get lots of eyeballs. Um, but no, they're not representative. And I think that social media might be distorting that. But here I'm gonna pass it back to this guy who actually does study social media as a phenomena and the role that it might be playing in changing how we think. Yeah, I actually, so uh, I just published an essay in The Atlantic two days ago um, called, uh, well, they titled it The Dark psychology of social media, but my original title was why it feels like everything is going haywire. And the key insight that I got from working with a guy who understands social media, I'm not, I'm you know, an old guy who barely uses it other than Twitter occasionally. Um, Tobias Rose Stockwell is an insider, worked for a bunch of the tech companies. The story we tell in this is a very short article, is that between 2009 and 2012, um, uh, social media changed radically in ways that I think, are, we think are incompatible with democracy uh, and that may ultimately destroy democracy because the early days of social media, it was Friendster and MySpace and the Facebook. And it was, here's me, here are my favorite bands, and I'm linked to these people. Okay, that's not gonna destroy democracy. It just makes it a little <coughs> superficial and shallow, that's all, okay? But in 2009, you get the like button, and now um, everything's being rated. And now all people are, are, are basically training each other, just like Skinner training a pigeon. I will reinforce what I like, and that will sh everybody's going to shape everyone's behavior. So this really has a big impact on young people. You get the like button. Uh, Twitter copies it. Uh, Twitter develops the retweet button. Facebook copies it. Um, uh, you get algorithmicizing the news feed rather than chronological. And in 2013, the news media now adapts to it, and now the cycle is complete. Everything now is exactly this outrage cycle. Not everything. I need to not exaggerate, especially when I'm talking with you. But we get this new dynamic where the news media and social media and outrage and deep human psychology for tribal warfare are all tightly interconnected. And that's there by 2013. The Russians start in 2014 because we made the ultimate information, dis, dis, what do they call it, disinformazione, whatever, they, you know, the, the Russian disinformation campaign, we made the machine for them, put it out there in 2013, and they used it. I mean, you would not believe what they are. I mean, I've begun reading about this, what they are doing and still doing to us. In North Korea, Iran, it's so easy to mess with a democracy because we all have this big opening in our skull saying, drop outrage stuff here, and they will do it. So yes, I actually think that America is at risk of catastrophic failure. If present trends continue, I think our country will fail catastrophically. Uh, now, present trends don't always continue. That's what I learned from Steve Pinker. I'm not saying, I'm not betting against America, but I'm saying the problems we face are so severe I am extremely afraid for the future of our country because of social media. Um, actually, before we go to the last question, I know there's, uh, the microphone's going around. I wanted, um, I was want, I was like to do do uh, something here, which is just ask what what is the culture here? There are big differences. Um, what is is there is there a call out culture here? Um, is there? Okay, okay, well let's see. So, uh, it, so the question is, do you feel in your class? We have to specify in your classes. And let's talk about especially humanities and social science classes. In your classes, do you feel free, and do you think there's generally a free climate where people, if someone says something, someone can question it, challenge it, you can speak up, or do you feel as though you or others have to really self-censor because you're afraid what other people will say, will say about it? So, um, the, so it's, it's, do you have, a, uh, to some extent, a call-out culture where people are walking on eggshells, or do you have a free culture in which people can really speak their minds pretty honestly? Raise your hand if you'd say you have a call-out culture, a lot of self-censoring. Raise your hand high. Okay, and raise your hand if you'd say no. Basically, you have a good culture here, people can speak. Okay, so it's mixed. I've seen all sorts of things. Um, so certainly, if I, when I speak in New England, especially at top schools, it's, it's almost everybody raises their hand. So you're, do, you're doing better. I mean, this is obviously not a representative sample, you know, people who chose to come here. But, but it sounds like there are elements of it here, but it is not so pervasive that everybody has seen it. So it sounds like you're doing better than average, which is great. Okay, on to the last question. Do you think it's problematic for the presidents of colleges and universities to comment on politics? Yeah, yeah please. Uh, yeah. I don't. Now, let's distinguish two different things. First of all, there are political issues that are specifically germane to what universities do. We should, presidents should, for instance, comment on 
state funding decisions about universities or uh, issues related to student visas. Fa they've been very vocal, in fact, in the last two years <coughs> about those very issues. Now, there's a separate kind of question. Let's say <coughs> um, Spencer, uh, Richard Spencer, this uh, white supremacist, is coming to campus tomorrow. What should the professor do? What should the, the president. president do? I think that the president should speak up and affirm the values of the university as being contrary to the speaker who's coming. Not block him from speaking, but uh, making a point of affirming the views of the university uh, are, are completely opposite uh, to, to those that you're about to hear. I think that those sorts of affirmations actually do a lot of good. And I think that one of the reasons why we've seen a decline in deplatforming attempts in 2018 is because a lot more presidents were doing just that. They were actually <coughs> responding to these threats and trying to reassure people, you are welcome here. This white supremacist is speaking, but he does not speak for the university. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so in, in, a, in a cultural war where left and right hate each other more and more, it's sort of like imagine a magnetic field that gets uh, uh, stronger and stronger and stronger and anything with any valence gets pulled over to one side. And so, uh, you know, the news media, which leans left, well, in a culture where it gets pulled left, and it literally is getting pulled left, but then the right hates it even more, and we have the loss of trust in one of our most important institutions in a democracy. Universities lean left, but have long had the respect of both sides. Now, there's interesting polling from both Gallup and one other, maybe it's Pew, that while Democrats have always supported universities or higher ed more than Republicans, it, support was pretty high on both, as it is for the military, but just reversed. So strong support, if you go back to 2014 and before, strong support for universities and the military in this country. Um, and then what you find is from 2015 to 2017, support among Democrats stays very high, but support among Republicans plummets. Yep. And I think one of the reasons is people saw all the videos and, and all the, the right-wing outlets are forwarding them, but they, re, they are real videos. I mean, what, what the students did to the Christakis and the fact that the president didn't stand up to it really cratered support on the right for universities and higher ed. So, to get back to the question, given the perilous state of universities, especially in red states, given the culture war and the declining trust on the right in the news media and universities and many other institutions, it is extremely important for universities to stick close to their fiduciary duty to their students, to their duty as educators, and to not be the research arm of the Democratic Party. So some of the presidents after Trump was elected acted like, of course, we're all grieving. Right. We are all grieving about this election. Come to my house, we'll have tea and cookies and we'll cry together. That's horrible. That is a horrible thing to do. So like Jeff, I think it's totally appropriate if the president opines, as probably all of our presidents did when Trump had the immigration ban. Well, you know, universities really require, you know, we have enormous numbers of foreign students. So for the president to say, we think this is inappropriate, this is, you know, blocking the flow of ideas and people. So when it's relevant to university, I think it's very appropriate. But they have to always remember both practically and morally, we're in a culture war in which there's suspicion of universities, um, avoid gratuitous political comments, and remember that you are the president of the whole university, not just of the left. <laughs>